Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Atlantic Council for today's event. And thank you for braving the elements this morning and the traffic and, uh, and coming out here. Uh, I'm Dick Morningstar, chairman of the Global Energy Center, and uh, again, very happy that you're all here. The event today is called the U.S. Navy and Cutting Edge Energy Innovation in the Defense Sector. And we're very pleased to be partnering with our friends at The Fuse uh, for today's event. It's a publication that's well known to all of us energy nerds. Uh, and if you're not familiar with The Fuse, I would strongly encourage you to uh, check out the uh, great work that they're doing covering energy policy, markets, uh, and, uh, and technology. And within the Atlantic Council, uh, we're very happy to be collaborating um, with our colleagues in the Brent Scowcroft Center uh, on international security for today's session. And one of the good things about the council is that there is more and more collaboration uh, among, uh, among the different centers. And we're also lucky to have a great panel of experts and practitioners uh, here with us today to lend insights into some of the major initiatives that the Navy and defense industry more broadly have taken to, to make our armed forces greener and more energy, more energy secure. And I can't, one of the things that we're really interested in at the Global Energy Center is the relationship between new technologies, uh, climate change issues, and national security. And I think that is one of the ways to ultimately attain bilateral, uh, bipartisan uh, support uh, for these issues. Anyway, kicking off, kicking off today will be Dennis McGinn, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy, Installation, Energy Installations and Environment. And in that capacity, he works to implement uh, cutting edge clean energy initiatives like the Great Green Fleet. I hadn't heard of that one. I'm sort of imagining this, all these green ships running around. Any event, Prior to assuming its, his current position, uh, the Assistant Secretary was the president of the American Council on Renewable Energy, ACOR, and, uh, which is an interesting transition. And, uh, and maybe we'll hear more about that uh, uh, later. Uh, and have, you've served as a naval officer and ultimately achieving the rank of Vice Admiral. Uh, joining Assistant Secretary McGinn is Phyllis Kutno, the director of the Clean Energy Initiative at the Pew Charitable Trusts. Um, and she is a foremost expert on DOD's energy posture and efforts, uh, operational and installation, uh, to ensure mission assurance, greater effectiveness, and taxpayer savings. Uh, and our final panelist, Dan Chu, uh, is the deputy director of the Brent Scowcroft Center here at the Atlanta Council, and he is a former deputy deputy assistant secretary of defense for strategy and force development. And Dan has worked extensively on issues relating to energy, climate, and national security, and has co-authored an Atlantic Council report on climate change and national security that was just published a few a few weeks ago. We have copies, by the way, of that report available, and I would encourage you to, uh, I would encourage you to grab a copy. As a final housekeeping note, I would encourage you all uh, to join the conversation on Twitter by following along at uh, AC Global Energy and at Energy Fuse and using hashtag AC Energy. And with that, I'll turn things over to Assistant Secretary McGinn. Good morning. Thank you, Ambassador Morningstar. It's uh, really great to be here at this esteemed uh, think tank. I think that that's a good term to apply. At the Atlantic Council, done great work uh, over the decades. It's wonderful to be here. Good to be here and see uh, Dan Chu. We miss you, Dan, over at the Pentagon. You, your work uh, there continues. Phyllis Cutno uh, from Pew, and uh, I'm just met Annie a while ago, but uh, her reputation and the great work that you're doing with this energy initiative is, uh, is really, really good. Attention on deck. Secretary of the Navy arriving. How 
are you, Senator? Permission to uh, permission granted to enter the bridge. <laughs> Petty Officer Third Class Warner has just arrived. And <laughs> it's great to see you, sir. So um, Ambassador Morningstar asked uh, or made mo note of the fact that uh, seeming uh, disparity in terms of a guy who's a uh, retired admiral and uh, president of the American Council on uh, Renewable Energy. And I just need to explain briefly how that happened. It started a long time ago. I've got to tell you a sea story about this. And the sea story begins, as most do, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> Out in the Western Pacific, trying to fly my single engine jet aboard an aircraft carrier, bouncing around. There was thunder and lightning, there was fog, there was all kinds of turbulence, and I'm just fighting as, as hard as I could to get it lined up on glide slope, on speed, to try to land aboard that ship. And all of a sudden, as I'm about a mile out from the ship, it seemed to me in a flash of consciousness, what we need to do in the United States Navy is invent a solar-powered airplane. That way, I would only fly in the daytime and when the sun was shining. And ever since then, I've been in love with renewable energy. Energy security, uh, economic security, environmental security, and national security are all inextricably linked. You can't really do much in any one of those areas without having some effect, positive or not, in the other areas. So when we in the Department of the Navy take a look at our energy portfolio, where we are today, business as usual, if you will, to where we want to be uh, down the road, it is with that uh, interaction, that interdependency of economic, environmental, and uh, energy that underpin our national security. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase our mission effectiveness and our operational efficiency. That starts with energy efficiency across all of our domains. Ashore at our installations, 96 around the world, Navy and Marine Corps installations. We uh, just uh, commissioned uh, our uh, num number 96 uh, in Romania, an Aegis Ashore uh, facility for missile defense, and we'll have another one in about two years in Poland. So our footprint, if you will, ashore is growing. But we want to make sure that our energy portfolio is uh, incorporating the best technologies in terms of energy efficiency and renewable energy to displace brown power wherever it makes sense, wherever there's a business case. A float, and in the air, we are looking very, very hard and having some success in developing biofuel blends, blends with uh, biofuel from uh, various feedstocks with petroleum blends, and Ambassador Morningstar mentioned the Great Green Fleet. The Great Green Fleet was uh, launched in the form of the, uh, the Stennis, John C. Stennis Strike Group, uh, which is out in the Western Pacific as we, as we speak here today in Washington. And uh, Secretary Mabus, our Secretary of the Navy, and Secretary Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture, and I were out in San Diego to see off the Stennis Strike Group. And for the first time, as a result of regular procurement from the Defense Logistics Agency, that strike group sailed with a blend of biofuels. Uh, we uh, went out, flew out to uh, the uh, USS William uh, P. Lawrence, a great uh, Arleigh, Burke uh, Arleigh Burke destroyer, for an underway replenishment with the USNS Guadalupe. And it was the first time that uh, DLA procured biofuel blend had been transferred uh, to the William P. Lawrence. And we had uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Stockdale as part of that battle group. And they are out there doing some wonderful work uh, with, the, with the Seventh Fleet. Our Marine Corps, since about 2010, in all of the expeditionary operations, has recognized the value of uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy where it makes sense. Probably the most dramatic example was uh, in uh, Kandahar in 2010-2011 uh, where India Company 3-5 Marines deployed with solar panels 
that uh, were used in the forward operating base and greatly cut down on the dependence on diesel fuel to power the, the diesel generator sets to give them electricity. This was key because it cut down on the number of convoys that the Marines had to bring in with fuel and water. And uh, the, the shocking, uh, absolutely dismal fact was that there was one Marine killed or injured per every 50 convoys that we had to do. So anything that we could do at the forward edge there, at the forward operating bases, to cut down on the need for diesel fuel literally saved lives. And importantly, it allowed the Marine Corps that were in those forward, in, in the Marines in those forward operating bases to concentrate their efforts on the, going after the Taliban, uh, not on simply guarding, uh, guarding convoys with, with fuel. A quick story. One of these forward op operating bases in Kandahar came under uh, fire from the Taliban. Uh, the Marines prevailed. Uh, after the uh, battle was over, they discovered a significant amount of damage to some of the solar panels that uh, were in the base providing uh, electrical power. But the lights never went off. The efficiency went down because some of the, the uh, panels were damaged, but it kept producing electricity. And I was thinking, what if uh, it had been a rocket propel grenade and a shrapnel from it that went into a diesel generator set? Certainly the lights would have gone out immediately and uh, Marines probably would have been killed or injured. So just an example of this is all about war fighting. Yes, we talk about great green fleet and the green hornet and, and various uh, climate related and environmental related attributes of our changing energy portfolio. But primarily, it's about increasing mission effectiveness and operational efficiency. In terms of uh, uh, working with allies, we are getting ready for the rim of the Pacific exercise 2016, which will be conducted in the Hawaiian operating area in July. This is under the uh, command of, uh, of Admiral Nora Tyson, the commander of U.S. Third Fleet. And uh, we have uh, uh, navies from 54 nations that will be participating in that. And we are reaching out to many of those navies that will actually have ships involved in RIMPAC 2016 and providing them with samples of our biofuel blend because we are telling them that this is effectively uh, the same as regular petroleum fuel in terms of meeting ASTM standards. And uh, we are finding 100% acceptance rate for the navies so that we are not only doing this biofuel blend uh, for our own navy, but for uh, for other navies as well. And I use the example of RIMPAC to point that out. Additionally, in the, uh, in the Atlantic or Mediterranean theater, in June, Secretary Mabus will be going over to uh, Italy and uh, will be uh, witnessing an underway replenishment from an Italian oiler and United States Navy ships, along with uh, Vice Admiral uh, Jamie Fogo, our Sixth Fleet commander, who will be uh, transferring biofuel blends produced in Italy, blended in Italy, and uh, being used by both Italian and uh, other NATO nation ships, and especially United States Navy ships. So across the board, uh, this changing uh, energy portfolio makes a lot of sense. Some would say, well, wait a second. Why are you pursuing biofuels when we have a seeming abundance of, uh, of petroleum around in the world? The prices are down below uh, $40 a barrel, sometimes below $30 a barrel. Why are you uh, spending any time and any resources to uh, develop biofuels? Well, the answer, I think, is uh, obvious to most people in the room. We don't gauge our efforts thinking about the next quarterly report or next annual report or even the next election cycle. We think beyond that, five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road, and we determine what is the kind of security environment in which our Navy and Marine Corps expeditionary team needs to prevail. And what we see in that, uh, that down the road, over the horizon environment is a lot of competition for regular uh, petroleum-based fuel. Uh, in the next uh, 25 to 30 years, an increase in the world's population from over 7 billion today to 9 billion by 2050 and increasing pr 
prices for uh, all energy sources and competition for those energy sources. So it makes sense if we can diversify our portfolio and not simply say the, uh, the abundance of uh, petroleum that we have today will, will uh, continue for the next uh, uh, three, four, five decades. We don't believe it will. And we will have an alternative from different types of feedstocks to uh, help power our Navy and Marine Corps team. Related to environment, climate change, global warming, absolutely uh, critical events. Uh, Dan uh, Chu did a great job when he was at uh, the, in the Department of Defense and OSD to document in the Quadrennial Defense Review and other documents that from a global warming and climate change perspective that the United States Department of Defense and all the services got it. We understood that climate change would act as a threat multiplier for instability in critical regions of the world. And by this, I mean, if you look around the world right today, think about all of the fault lines that uh, we are having tensions across. In some cases, all-out war. Look to the Middle East. Look to Ukraine. The competition for uh, territory and resources in the South China Sea. And ethnic lines, religious lines, uh, economic lines, there is conflict going on. In many of these cases, uh, we have fragile societies and fragile governments. Add to that fragility this dynamic of increased intensity and frequency of uh, climate-related, global warming-related weather, whether it's long-term multi-year droughts or whether it's flooding or monsoons, typhoons, hurricanes, and you have a recipe for making those failed societies and failed governments completely uh, or fragile going to failed. When you have a failed society and government, you have a vacuum of power and all kinds of bad things happen in that. Could be uh, uh, terrorism, paramilitaries, uh, uh, organized crime, but it is a recipe for more mission for our wonderful young men and women in uniform and all of the services to do everything from increased frequency of humanitarian assistance, disaster recovery, all the way up to regional war as a result of this uh, new dynamic called climate change. So we, uh, in, the, uh, in the Department of Defense and especially the Department of the Navy, by our efforts to change our energy portfolio, are actually helping to mitigate somewhat the, uh, the contribution of greenhouse gases. It's not the primary reason we're doing it. It is, as I said, for mission effectiveness and operational efficiency. However, it does have that beneficial effect. But on the adaptation side, or how do we increase our resiliency, here in, in uh, the United States at our bases, we're looking at things like areas like Hampton Roads, the largest concentration of naval forces in the world, literally. And uh, we are already being affected down there and have for a number of years with these so-called king tides. Add to that the probability of uh, a Category 3 hurricane coming up the East Coast, and you have a real danger to our ability to operate out of that naval complex, that naval installation, and continue to, uh, continue to be uh, effective. Out on the West Coast, we are concerned about droughts, and California certainly is getting more rain this year, but still very much in the uh, historic drought. What that does in places like, uh, like uh, Camp Pendleton, where we train our Marines for uh, deployment to the Pacific, we see an inability to uh, do live fire training to uh, get those Marines ready to go to train like they, they would be called upon to fight because of uh, wildfire danger in a lot of the ranges out there. So the uh, threats, if you will, that are, are being presented by global warming and climate change are many and varied, and they directly affect our ability to uh, operate our installations and to conduct realistic training across the board. So we're taking this seriously. I think there's also uh, a dimension of opportunity for us to work with our allied nations and, and partners in that this is a common threat. Uh, climate change manifesting itself as it will in many different ways around the world 
constitutes a common threat to the collective good. So this provides an opportunity for us to have dialogue with partners and allies along the lines of how can we collectively increase our resiliency? What are the projects, the civil works projects that we can do? What are the different ways of operating together, training together, that can help us to address this threat of climate change, this challenge? And uh, I think that will open up a whole line of discussions and exercises and command post exercises that will be very, very helpful to strengthening our uh, partnerships around the world. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and end there. I look forward to uh, participating in the, in the panel. I hope that Annie takes it easy on us with the questions. But we are all very, very anxious to get to your questions and address the things on your mind that uh, relate to energy, economy, environment, and ultimately national security. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to be here and to talk about this. And more importantly, it's amazing to see the relationship that all three of you have from different sectors and different periods in your career and to know how important this is. And um, just to be able to see that, I think, is, is great um, for the audience. So I'm going to throw the first question to Assistant Secretary McGinn. Um, I really want to delve into kind of the Navy's relationship with the private sector, DOD, and the Navy in general. As you're going towards more renewables, what type of impact has this had on, on the private sector? Is there, um, are you driving the demand for it through RFPs or, um, or I guess ARPA-E as well, or right. DARPA, or is the private sector coming to you and saying, okay, we have X, Y, and Z? Can you talk about that interplay? I'll, I'll paraphrase. Uh Annie, that uh, great phrase from uh, Field of Dreams. Uh, we say, if you build it, we will come. If you build a biorefinery, we have a demand for biofuel to put in our ships and our, in our aircraft in our Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, if you build a uh, solar uh, field or geothermal uh, capability, or wind capability, we want to access that where it makes sense and where there's a business case. So uh, our work with the private sector, I'll give you a specific example. We uh, were given a goal in May of 2014 that by the end of 2015 uh, that uh, Secretary Babis wanted us to have in various stages of procurement over one gigawatt of renewable energy. Well, we achieved that. We're up at one point, uh, we got to 1.1 gigawatts, and we're considering that a floor, not a ceiling. And we did that almost exclusively with uh, private uh, public partnerships. Third party financing, we used mechanisms like power purchase agreements. Mm -hmm. Sempra, a large energy company uh, located in San Diego, built uh, or is in the process of building a 150 megawatt solar farm uh, 50 miles west of Phoenix. That will produ produce electrons for one third of our need, our total need, in our 14 major installations in California. Uh, and it will do it over a period of 25 years, saving us at a minimum 90 million, and more likely, looking at some of the uh, Wall Street projections, $400 million. So it's cleaner, it's cheaper, it diversifies the portfolio, and it's really good. So yeah, the, the private sector is really, really critical to it. The other aspect of it is, we're trying to bring in as many new ideas. We do a lot of work with uh, ESCOs or energy services companies, names that you would recognize, GE, uh, Johnson Controls, Honeywell, the list goes on. But we're introducing them, uh, we call it speed dating, uh, to some of the smaller companies that have really, really good ideas related to energy efficiency and renewable energy. So this public-private partnership uh, is essential to us achieving our goals. Great, thank you. What surprised you the most as you, as the Navy embarked on this use of greater, greater renewables? What didn't you expect to, to see? And um, I guess, yeah, what right. surprised you? Well, in terms of energy, uh, we always start, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, end with discussions about the technology, microgrids or solar, wind, what have you. But there are two other essential elements. You touched on one just a while ago, and that's partnerships. 
especially partnerships across government and with the private sector. But the other one is culture. People have to understand and value the role of energy in every aspect of our lives, and certainly in our life in the Navy and the Marine Corps, uh, our, uh, our profession of arms, our expeditionary capabilities. And the thing that has been pleasantly surprising to me is the rapidity with which our culture has embraced uh, the need for changing our energy portfolio to uh, be as energy efficient as possible. Everybody from admirals and generals on down to, uh, to seamen and lance corporals really are getting uh, on a daily basis. The uh, idea of the, the great green fleet, that is simply a mechanism to uh, create conversations and actually pr create platforms to demonstrate what you can do with uh, energy efficiency. And I'll just mention briefly, we ultimately, in terms of our operations in our Navy and Marine Corps, are not going to judge ourselves about how much money we save or how many gallons of liquid fuel or megawatts of electricity. Those are all good, but it's all about increasing the time on station for a ship that is uh, guarding against uh, ballistic missiles or in a tomahawk box or Marines being able to go further faster and stay there longer because they are much more energy efficient. No, that's, that's great. Thank you. So Phyllis, um, jumping to you, uh -huh. Pew has done a ton of research on this topic, on mission assurance, effectiveness, taxpayer savings. Can you kind of comment on what you've heard from Assistant, Sec Assistant Secretary McGinnis and where do, you, where do you see the Navy being effective? Where do you think we can go in the future? Um, it'd be great to hear your thoughts. Well, let me just back up and say, you know, what we've done is really look at two kinds of energy, which is operational energy and installation energy. And when you look at it, the Navy has, and, and fr frankly, all of the Department of Defense have really seen energy as both a risk and an enabler. And a as the Assistant Secretary talked about, this really comes out of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, where, you know, he talked about the convoys and so on and so forth. Look, 80% of what we used at, at peak deployment used to be shipped to the battlefield used to be fuel. And if you look ahead, and sure, the natural gas and oil uh, prices are going to be a good thing for the future, but with our shift in strategy to the Asia Pacific, we're gonna have to go further. With the amount of, the, you know, the platforms are becoming more energy intensive, and so we're gonna need more fuel. So, um, and, and when you look ahead, you know, DOD buys most of it, the majority of its fuel overseas, not here at home. So operational energy, this is not a fad. This, is a, this has real staying power. What they you know, really put, learned 10 years ago and have put into place through a series of strategic documents, whether or not it's the energy performance uh, master plan or goals by all the service branches or, um, or operate, first ever operational energy strategy that was just uh, released in 2011 and then updated again. This is enduring and they're making real progress. So if you look overall, um, the, the Department of Energy has said that the Department of Defense consumption has dropped to its lowest point since 1975, 78% from 90%. So you're seeing real progress and they're continuing it. If you look across installation energy, not just fuel, but power, you know, when you think about it, 87 outages in 2011 alone of eight hours of more on bases costing $7 million. So that has a real impact when you're talking about mission assurance. You know, we talked about war fighting capabilities, but mission assurance looking forward. You know, forward operations are supported by unmanned aerial vehicles, which are, you know, which are run from here in the United States. They can't afford to go down. They have to have assured power 24-7. And so what's been happening on bases is nothing short of remarkable. I mean, I brought a, a few statistics here. As of 2015, DOD had reduced its energy, facility energy intensity almost 18% from 2003 levels. They've procured 12% of their electricity from renewable resources. Ad, uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary McGinn, I still want to call you Admiral, mm -hmm. talked about you know, DO, uh, the Navy being ahead of meeting its one gigawatt goal. Petroleum consumption and, and the base vehicle fleet's been reduced by 30, 34%, 64 million gallons of gas annually. So you have the age energy savings um, projects, which have gone up to 1,300 between 2010 and 2012. I mean, it's really remarkable. 50% of all microgrids here in the United States are deployed on, on, energy, on military bases. So 
This is really an enduring proposition, which, as I said, you know, the, the, um, the Navy has been a real leader, whether or not it is in advanced biofuels, whether or not it's meeting its, its um, uh, one gigawatt goal early. Um, remember, this was a 2020 goal. The Navy has among the most pro uh, aggressive goals, not a 2025 goal, but a 2020 goal. And so there's really been kind of, this is the notion of energy and how to change its energy posture has really been um, taken on and is an enduring proposition for them. I, I'd like to uh, really emphasize that last point that Phyllis made about it being an enduring proposition. Uh, occasionally, uh, I'll get asked questions, well, what happens after this administration leaves and, uh, you know, uh, President Obama uh, leaves and uh, Secretary Mavis, et cetera? And my answer is nothing as far as our energy initiative and our energy momentum because the business case is so powerful. The war fighting business case, the uh, fiscal uh, business case, it just makes sense. And uh, it's unfortunate that years ago, uh, energy was so politicized, but I think we've, we're, we're getting over that very, very quickly, and people are realizing that we're doing this not just uh, to, because we're closet tree huggers or, uh, or anything like that. Uh, we are, but uh, it is because we are, we are in the business of fielding the most uh, expeditionary capable Navy and Marine Corps team we possibly can, and that is an enduring uh, principle. Well, and besides, you know, there's also a constrained budget environment. Right. And so in addition to enhancing warfighting capabilities or mission effectiveness and mission assurance, there's also saving taxpayer dollars. And every dollar is precious to the Department of Defense, and any money they save on energy can be put into other areas of mission. And so that's critically important as well. So this is having huge advantages for us now, and even more so hopefully in the, in the future. Are there other um, allies, navies out there that are implementing such, I guess, strong procedures like we are? I mean, you mentioned right. RIMPAC, that there will be yes. cooperation there. You mentioned going to Italy. Um, can you give us some more concrete examples sure. of what other nations uh, are really at the forefront of Well, of course, of we work very closely with, our, with, with the Royal Navy, uh, United mm -hmm. Kingdom, uh, Italy, uh, Australia, Chile, and uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, southern uh, hemisphere, and uh, the list goes on. But everyone is interested in uh, seeing how they can leverage energy efficiency technology. I mentioned in terms of operational energy, of course, the biofuel, but beyond that, the energy efficiency that we're building into our ships, bulbous bows, uh, stern flaps, power monitoring systems, hybrid electric drive for two of our big uh, air-capable amphibs, the USS uh, Macon Island and the USS America, and we're uh, also going to hybrid electric drive for our uh, retrofits as well as forward fits on our Arleigh Burke destroyers. Interesting. Um, Phyllis, are, is Pew looking into what other allies are doing at all in this, or have they been focused on the U.S.? We haven't. We've really been focused on the United States, okay. and so we've been looking at DOD, but we, you know, I think we're, we have two reports that we're looking at in the future. One. Um, is a part of the Department of Defense that most people don't think about, which is our National Guard. You know, if there's anybody that knows about how to, you know, operating um, without the appropriate resources when it comes to energy, it's the National Guard. And with more extreme weather events, with more humanitarian missions, um, you know, they, these folks are being called on more and more, just as the Department of Defense is. So, expanding missions and roles. And I think the other thing that, is a, that we're looking at that is a challenge, frankly, for the Department of Defense is the notion of how you value energy security and strategic mm -hmm. planning. Because one of the things that the Department of Defense faces is that energy is really a priority without a premium. And they can't pay more for um, you know, alternative energy than they can traditional energy. And so that is where the value of these public-private partnerships come in, where you can really leverage the resources and finances of the private sector to kind of get mission and goals accomplished. But that's a real struggle. And so how do you, you, know, how do you tackle that in the future? Thanks. All right, Dan. Zooming out. Um, good, good transition to you. So can you talk a little bit about the impact of this on U.S. national security, geopolitics? We've heard the Assistant Secretary talk about competition for petroleum. Prices are only going to continue to increase, and, and we're, we buy fuel from, from others. So can you, can you delve into this and give us kind of the current and the forward-looking 
um, strategic picture? Yeah, so my perspective is a strategic planning perspective, and my priority was really to work these considerations into the kind of strategic planning that DOD does, both on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and quadrennially, thanks to the quadrennial uh, defense review. So both to set it as a priority every four years and then to actually do it uh, as we go along. And the way we did it is very much in the way that's been explained already. I can't uh, add anything to what uh, Denny and Phyllis have said. We really looked at the long-term context, and there were so many needs, both in the long-term and the near nearer term and the interim, uh, to really think about diversification uh, of energy sources, uh, greater uh, uh, greater uh, effectiveness and efficiency with regard to uses of energy, that this just made sense from a strategic uh, planning standpoint. And I'll just give a, a couple of examples. You know, we look at a lot of long-term trends, all the ones that everybody thinks we do, technology, or technology, militaries, even things like demographics, economics, and politics, of course, when we think about what the long-term future is. Not surprising, we look at energy trends uh, as well. Back when I started with the administration in 09, everybody was very concerned about the constantly rising uh, costs uh, of energy. Uh, as Denny mentioned before, that's not the issue anymore. But that doesn't mean because that's not the issue right now, it's not the issue in the future. What we're seeing in the future, as Denny rightly pointed out, is still increasing demand from more and more competition for energy resources. And now we're starting to see the potential for a consolidation of some energy infrastructure, for example, because of the low price uh, of oil. That may actually constrain supply in some ways, which then could create uh, cost issues again. Only prudent then to hedge with uh, diversifi diversification of energy uh, sources. We're seeing regional instability that could also impinge on, especially with the global market uh, of energy, that could also impinge on the availability and the cost uh, of energy over time, which again argues for that kind of uh, diversification. And then from a force development side, which was the other half of my portfolio at OSD, really thinking about operational effectiveness, efficiency, mission assurance were really, really critical. And Denny and, and Phyllis have already touched on all of those. But as you can imagine, being able to deploy longer, to be, being able to deploy further, being able to deploy more safe safely with less reliance on more vulnerable logistics, absolutely critical to when DOD is thinking about. So all of those should be logical, obvious things that DOD is doing all the time. And my job, at least as I saw, was really to find ways to address that all the way through the system, uh, and not surprisingly a lot in the budgetary uh, process. And this is not an insignificant issue. Phyllis is exactly right to say. Let's, and it's not just constrained budgets, right? Even if somehow, uh, and I don't think this is necessarily the best thing, but we went to a point where we weren't worried about budgets again. This is actually, and not just an efficiency from a cutting standpoint, but an efficiency from where can dollars be better spent, uh, both within DOD, but also across uh, the USG. Uh, as well. So I think that's exactly the right uh, point to emphasize here. These are all great points, and to go back to Denny's point, the way to ensure that this is about common sense, this is not about politics, and this endures, this is not about uh, uh, rotating political leadership, is to make sure that these items are considered in exactly this kind of strategic uh, planning uh, approach. The effects to me, at least when I left government back in 2014, uh, were beginning to show, but were limited. And I'd be actually interested in what, what Denny would say. We were getting more and more interest from international uh, allies and partners. And one I would add to the list that's already been raised is Japan. Japan, not surprisingly, is rather concerned about their uh, energy uh, uh, resilience over time and is thinking very, very hard about how to diversify uh, and increase their efficiency for particularly their naval forces, but in general uh, as well. So we're seeing that happen uh, more broadly. We're seeing others working with us on how to operationally, not just in terms of energy sources, but how we can actually rethink planning for operations to ensure we're considering the, op the energy implications of those uh, operations. So we're seeing these effects uh, starting to happen, particularly uh, amongst uh, allies uh, and partners. And then the last thing I, I would just add again as kind of a, a strategic planner is don't forget the threat uh, side to this. Uh, we hear a lot about the A2AD uh, threat out there, and, and people focus on different aspects of it. One aspect I focused on was A2AD was particularly focused on our logistics trains uh, and the ability to impede that and really deny our ability to operate uh, in regions. And to the extent that this uh, gives us greater resilience in that regard, uh, this is really critical from that perspective as well. And, with, uh, and, and if effective, can also work not just on uh, promoting collaboration between allies and partners, but ho 
hopefully on dissuading and deterring uh, adversaries and potential adversaries uh, as well. Um, th the last point I'll say, and this is more as a public citizen than as a, a former government person, and, and Denny alluded to this uh, as well. You know, you can tell by all the things that I'm talking about from a strategic planning standpoint that I'm mostly falling on what I would at least largely categorize as the adaptation uh, side, what the military can do should these things uh, arise. Uh, but I agree with Denny, and I think this is very important. If we just focus on adaptation, we're not addressing the root causes of the problem. In fact, we're letting the root causes of the problem get worse. Uh, and the extent to which this contributes to mitigation, from my, con my perspective, is absolutely uh, an important consideration. Not mission number one for Department of Defense, but a very, very important contribution to the overall effort. Can I, can I just say, you know, I mean, I think one of the really important roles that the Department of Defense plays that they often aren't given credit for is they're the world's largest employer, three million. They have, you know, two billion square feet of property, three times that of Walmart. And so when they take on these kinds of postures, when they worry about effectiveness, when they worry about, you know, um, conservation, when they worry about efficiency and these other things and move out, put, put advanced technologies um, in place and do other things, you know, given their reputation and their heft, their ability to be an early adopter, they really send a signal to the rest of the country. Um, and you see businesses really following suit. Businesses have to worry about their logistics, their supply chain. <laughs> you know, they've got to worry about um, their employees. They, you know, they, have, they don't have quite the same concerns, but they can see that DOD is really providing a blueprint for the rest of the economy about how we do change, how we do not only adapt, but mitigate. And so I think that's an important role that they don't often get credit for, and they really absolutely should, because their reputation, you know, DOD's reputation with the American people um, is, is, well, it's the best, according yeah. to the Pew Research Center and all of our polling, it's the best one you can have. So, I mean, I think that that signal that they are doing these things for a host of reasons, as I said, mission assurance, war fading capabilities, saving taxpayer dollars, but also with the impact of climate is really an important signal. Thanks. Dan. I think that's absolutely true, but I, I will add at least my uh, experience in this has it's been very much a two-way street. Uh, DOD has learned a lot by what businesses have actually gone ahead and done uh, even more than DOD has done uh, to date. And this, again, I think contributes to the argument that this is not a political uh, issue. There are a lot of common sense uh, aspects uh, to this. When you look at the extent to which private industry on its own, as you're suggesting, have looked at, for example, location and uh, disposition of their installations vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, sea level rise and, and different change, uh, changing flood patterns and weather patterns and so forth, uh, logistics vulnerabilities, rail, road, et cetera. Uh, and I've learned more and more since I've left the, the Pentagon about how the reinsurance company has really started uh, addressing this and started quantifying this in ways that, at least to my knowledge, Denny, I, I don't mean to, 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 to speak of stuff that you may be doing, but uh, to my knowledge, has actually far exceeded the, the extent to which DOD has been able uh, to tackle these. And we have a lot, to, DOD has a lot to learn from private industry in those respects. I think you're seeing a lot of very reinforcing actions uh, between a, the two. It's a two-way street. Dan, as you point out, uh, we are adopting a lot of commercial off-the-shelf types of technology. We're using uh, the third-party financing uh, quite a lot, as mm -hmm. I mentioned. And uh, it really is, uh, is beneficial to us to have new technology companies, old technology companies, large defense aerospace companies that are uh, changing their energy portfolios and their cultures as well. It's really very, very helpful. We are, in fact, uh, in the leadership role, as uh, Phyllis pointed out, uh, letting, I think, uh, America know this is OK. It isn't political. It's practical. It's uh, something that uh, goes to our best common sense uh, wisdom. And uh, we, we are going to continue to pursue this, uh, regardless of uh, what flavor of uh, the month is. Before we open up to the audience, Dan, I just want you to kind of preview what your, you co-authored a national security and, and climate change paper recently. Can you kind of give the audience a few top line summaries from that and, and your biggest takeaways? Yeah, so we released a paper just a couple of weeks ago on national security uh, and climate change. And really, it's a survey of, of thinking about climate change as a, 
uh, component of uh, national security or the effects of climate change as a component uh, of national security. And what I would really draw, it's a, it's a good survey for those of you who'd like to kind of see both the history and kind of the current and future implications of that. But what I really uh, took from it that I'd like to, to uh, recommend everybody think about is kind of the way forward uh, on this. We're at kind of an interesting place, I think, in the discussion on national security uh, and climate change. On the one hand, I think it's probably discussed much more uh, than it ever has been uh, in the past. On the other hand, I would also suggest that's a little bit of a double-edged uh, sword. It's really created some motivation and movement in some areas, and I'm pleased about that. Uh, but it's created what I might call a little bit of backlash uh, as well. There are some who think uh, that the connection is overstated uh, and uh, misrepresented uh, in some ways. Uh, I think that's unfortunate. I don't think that's what uh, we've done in, in over the past few years. But there are certainly some who, who feel that way. It, the, 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 what it really means is there's still a lot of politics uh, behind this discussion. And so since I've left government, one of the things I've really been focusing on is really trying to find a way to get some bipartisan agreement on the areas uh, that can be uh, advanced. Uh, and I think right now that's one of the most important things that we can do, going back to the point about how can we make this not about politics and how can we address really the common sense pieces. And what you'll see in the, in the uh, report, and, and one thing again I, I would put out there as kind of a cautionary note is, on the one hand, I think there is progress. Uh, even in the past couple of years uh, since I've left the Pentagon, year and a half since I've left the Pentagon, I've started to be able to have some discussions in some places that I wasn't able to have these discussions uh, before. Uh, not necessarily using the exact title, National Security and Climate Change, but certainly addressing many of the same uh, issues going forward. And I see opportunity there. That means to me there may be opportunities to address some of these specific issues uh, in more constructive ways, particularly over on uh, Capitol Hill. The area that does concern me, however, is that most of this focus is, again, on the adaptation, adaptation pieces. Uh, again, kind of going back to the discussion we were just having, a greater sense of, private, of the private sector being more and more involved, both in alternative energy uh, and in some of these adaptation uh, efforts, and therefore a greater willingness to consider that from a governmental perspective. That's good. I think it's necessary. I don't think it's sufficient. It goes back to my point before. It still leaves the mitigation piece uh, off the table. So I'm somewhat concerned, as a guy who does kind of these long-term projections and worries about the scenarios it creates in the future, I'm somewhat concerned that even with the opportunity we see now, if we really can only make progress on adaptation, we will see some improvement in terms of some of the things we've talked about today. But the underlying causes will remain unaddressed, and I'm still concerned about that. And that's the area now that I'm really trying to put some focus on how can we create some kind of bipartisan consensus in that. The, and the, the underlying cause that I think is most, po most uh, powerful is our energy portfolio. Mm. We have an energy portfolio that we have inherited that uh, has too much uh, greenhouse gases as a, as a result. Now, that energy portfolio, fossil fuels, has been absolutely wonderful to, uh, to this, uh, this nation and to, uh, and to our, our allies. It has brought us economic wealth, quality of life, uh, military capability, and we can't forget that. But we should also recognize that it's time to change. It's time to recognize what are the costs, what are the benefits, what are the uh, risks associated with our energy portfolio. And it's clear from a mitigation standpoint related to climate change that we have to change our energy mix. And we are. Uh, but the other aspect of this I think that is really, really powerful is that it isn't a zero-sum game. It isn't you have to choose uh, economic security or environmental security. You can have it both. We are creating new value chains for new ways of using energy in a very, very effective and efficient way. That's an American value, cons uh, conserving and, and being prudent uh, stewards of, uh, of the environment. But it's also, you can create value chains with new technologies that produce electricity, that store electricity, that allow us to use it so much more efficiently. So uh, it is that uh, interaction, that, uh, that, uh, that link between economic security and energy security and environmental security that we need to recognize, and it isn't a zero-sum game. Can Thank I you. Just yeah, Phyllis. Yeah. Climate change, we talked about Congress, and we talked about building will. And I have to recognize Senator Warner is with, her, uh, with us here today. And 
when Senator Warner was in the United States Senate and um, chairman of the Armed Services Committee, we can thank him and Hillary Clinton for requiring that the QDR did look at climate change and its security right. um, impacts. And he authored the very first Climate Security Act that was actually debated on the floor of the United States Senate. Bipartisan. Bipartisan. Mm -hmm. Now, he is a um, nationally known and renowned defense and energy expert, as well as a statesman and a dedicated public servant. But hopefully, Congress will get back to um, Senator Warner's agenda one day, and we'll address these issues. But, so, anyway. Thank you. So let's throw it open to the audience. Um, we'll go with you. If you can state your name and your affiliation, and wait and, for and a mic. Number. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can Chinese, trust them. You can Chinese just. Already have mine, so. <laughs> All right, I'm sure they have mine as well. So, um, Allison Versperly, National Defense Magazine. This question is directed at Assistant Secretary McGinn. Um, so we talked about the one gigawatt goal of energy for the Navy. What are some of the future goals the Navy has for its energy portfolio currently? Um, and then also, can you talk about some of the sort of cutting edge technologies that the Navy is interested in or is currently developing, pursuing? Right. Let me talk about uh, our shore installations, Navy and Marine Corps shore installations. Certainly the deployment of a gigawatt plus of renewable energy is a, a significant step, but it's only a step. Uh, the next steps are how do we leverage that uh, investment, that partnership with greater resiliency that provides uh, a lot more uh, adaptability in terms of uh, grid outages because of weather, because of terrorism, or mechanical failure, or what have you. And what I'm talking about there was mentioned earlier by Phyllis, and that's microgrids, where we uh, have the ability to uh, put a distribu use distributed a generation uh, from uh, our investments in, uh, in uh, renewable energy, but to uh, tie them with uh, storage capability to put in power monitoring and control systems that allow us to change almost instantaneously the load that is using that power, the sources of that power, and to blend them in an optimum way. I'll use an example uh, up at our Navy submarine base, New London, Connecticut. We are putting in eight gigawatts of, uh, of distributed uh, generation there, but we're also working with the state of Connecticut and the city of Groton so that in the next Superstorm Sandy, we are going to have a microgrid that will not only power the naval submarine base, but will power key parts of the city of Groton. First responders, medical facilities, and even a commercial corridor so that in the event of a grid outage in that area, we have regional resiliency that we didn't have before. It isn't simply a brightly lit uh, isolated island of, uh, of electricity on the naval submarine base. It is that plus the community that we uh, partner with that many of our workers and, and sailors and their families live in will have uh, key services during the time that we are recovering from a grid outage. Yes, Senator Warner. Thank you, Phyllis, for your nice comment. Uh, I've enjoyed my work with Pew and I've worked with you and the Admiral many years now. But um, I'd like to have your current assessment of the Hill. Are you, are you seeing progress? You've made a very persuasive case here today based on solid fact. Right. Uh, is that beginning to alleviate some of the criticisms and the annual battles that you've had before the Congress? That's part of our system, right? We get hearings exactly. and so forth. But it seems to me you should be making some headway. And are the other two military departments leading as strongly as Ray Mabus has directed the Department of the Navy? That's an yes, extraordinary sir. record on his part. He's gone through some heavy seas and storms up on the hill particularly and weathered them and brought the Navy to where we are today as a leader on this. And to Dr. Chu, touch on storage and batteries before we wrap up here. Senator, uh, it's a great observation that you make. It is changing uh, up on the Hill. Uh, I use as evidence uh, the uh, interaction at uh, Secretary Mabus's posture hearings before the Senate Armed Services Committee as well as the House Armed Services Committees uh, of uh, about six weeks ago. 
Uh, it just wasn't the heated issue about energy. Uh, I am looking forward this afternoon to uh, appear before the Senate Armed Services Committee subcommittee uh, on, uh, on readiness to talk about not just our energy portfolio, but uh, environment, as well as our installations portfolio, military construction and, uh, and uh, modernization. And I will be accompanied by my service counterparts, Secretary uh, Miranda Ballantyne and Catherine Hammock uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the Army, uh, uh, and Miranda from the Air Force. And they, too, are investing in a lot of the uh, technologies, the deployment of renewable energy that, that we are. Of course, being that we're the Department of the Navy, we're a little bit ahead. But, uh, but we welcome their, uh, their, uh, their, uh, th their efforts as well. We, we really do cooperate very well. And we get a lot of good ideas from our Army and Air Force counterparts, and we adopt them. We uh, get together on a fairly regular basis to compare notes and uh, it's really uh, something that is affecting the entire Department of Defense, not just the Department of the Navy. But I just want to underline uh, your, the point you made that uh, in October of 2009, brand new Secretary Ray Mabus set out some bold goals. By 2020, we're going to have uh, at least 50% of our energy, operational, shore installations, what have you, for our Navy and Marine Corps from non-fossil uh, and we non-fossil sources, and we're going to make that goal. And uh, it's a result of his uh, visionary leadership and uh, and insistence on uh, changing the, uh, the the technology mix, the culture, and uh, really valuing energy. Uh, two quick thoughts. Uh, one just on the congressional piece, based on my now increasingly outdated uh, experience with it, which was just extremely variable. Uh, reactions from folks, both when testifying and when talking in, in private. Particularly after QDRs, we got called to the Hill a lot to talk about why we had included uh, climate change uh, in the QDR. Uh, and we got responses from, I think, what you've heard on the panel here, which is very common sense responses. Uh, but we also got uh, very negative uh, responses, including you know, one uh, session I remember with a subcommittee uh, where I was being asked whether I was actually contributing to terrorism by trying to fight climate change, which was a rather remarkable uh, logic train. Uh, and another where uh, the day after testifying on the Hill, uh, we started receiving calls from staffers to identify programs that we were doing on climate change so that they could be zeroed out. Uh, so the extremes are still, uh, again, I speak with a little bit of removal from, from this process, but it, the extremes are still quite wide, and I think there's still a lot of work uh, to be done there. It's in a, about as political a season as you could possibly have. I'm, I'm hopeful uh, somewhat that afterwards uh, we can return to addressing the more common sense issues, but my experience was extremely variable uh, in that yeah. regard. Things, uh, are, things are changing. Uh, Po positively, That's good. and they're changing in the natural environment. Uh, last month, we wrapped up uh, rather prematurely ISEX 2016. We do this every two years, uh, led by the by the Navy. Uh, we have a submarine uh, operations uh, operating under the ice and through the ice, and we have a uh, oceanographic and meteorological uh, aspect to ISEX. This uh, year was four nations: United States, Canada, UK, and Denmark that were up there uh, north of uh, Point Barrow by about 200 miles. And uh, the plan was to be up there for about five weeks, to, taking measurements, doing operations. And we had to, after about three and a half weeks, uh, very quickly uh, remove all of the equipment because right next to the command hut, there was a 10-foot wide crack in the ice. We had a 2,000-foot uh, ice runway uh, that was able to accommodate uh, the larger airplanes because of uh, ice uh, cracking and, and folding up over itself. That was cut down to 1,000 feet uh, length of runway. Uh, we could not even get uh, snowmobiles from the ice camp uh, to the runway. We had to use uh, people on foot carrying packs and everything. Very, very uh, 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 d demonstrable change in how the ice is. Oh, by the way, this is the second ISEX in a row. In 2014, something very similar happened. We had to abandon even more quickly because of these cracks. I checked with the uh, National Center for Snow and Ice Analysis in Boulder, Colorado. This year is going to be uh, the least amount of ice ever and since they've been tracking 
uh, and this is a trend that's, that is continuing. Not only uh, the, uh, the breadth of the ice area coverage, but the, the, uh, the volume of the ice and, and its thickness. So things are literally changing, and it's a trend line. It isn't a one-of type of thing. And uh, I'm proud to say, though, that we are up there. We're operating in the Arctic. Uh, we had uh, embarked in uh, the USS Hartford, great uh, submarine uh, out, of, uh, out of Connecticut, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Sullivan, Dan Sullivan, from representing Alaska. And uh, he came away with a tremendous uh, perspective on not just what's happening in the Arctic, but the great submarine capabilities that we're operating. Batteries and storage, I'll give you two examples of how we were uh, thinking about this. And in particular, and I'll, I'll pair two things together. Uh, one of the key trends we were watching in energy were tech trends in batter batteries and storage and renewable distributable renewable distributable microgrids uh, going forward. And we worked them into the strategic planning. This is actually a good example of how we worked a lot of these types of issues into strategic planning in DOD. One was in thinking about the long-term scenarios. Uh, if there were the kinds of advances we were seeing uh, projected out in these key technology areas, what would that mean for the context we were operating in? And we did that both from a US and an others perspective. And from a US perspective, it created the kind of resilience and some expeditionary capabilities along the lines of, right. in particular, for the Marines and others who had to uh, deploy abroad and required uh, uh, energy supplies without necessarily having constant resupply. It really extended uh, ranges, durations, uh, etc. Et On the other side, it was really interesting. We saw some really interesting implications for changes in development patterns uh, and uh, other types of uh, longer-term socioeconomic uh, trends. Uh, if other countries were actually really able to take advantage of, you can imagine, for example, in Africa, where there's much wider spread uh, availability of energy without the requirement to set up a big centralized plant with a, grid, a central trunk grid that then feeds everything else, but rather to do it through this more distributed uh, way, we which does require battery and storage uh, capability to, uh, to work effectively. So that's one way we did it from kind of what I would call the strategic scenario uh, perspective. And we got people thinking about that, uh, hopefully in all the services, but certainly in OSD, we were thinking hard about that. The other is in the force development uh, area. I mean, quite frankly, in, in my opinion, the way we thought about energy in the force development uh, area in the past was, we'll get it there. Uh, and so we developed platforms and systems and just assumed we would get whatever energy there uh, was necessary. We don't make that assumption anymore. Uh, thanks in part to Sharon Burke, who we uh, were talking about earlier when she was in ATNL. We've considered energy now as one of the key criteria when we're thinking about these future platforms and systems. When we do that, suddenly these issues of mission assurance and, and effectiveness and efficiency come into play. And at that point, again, using the Marines as a good example, the importance of following and in some cases investing in storage and battery uh, technology becomes really quite critical to really ensuring we have the forces of the future that we're going to need. The prices of batteries are really coming down, Senator, and the variety of technologies for various battery uses are changing. Liquid flow batteries, our are, uh, are, are liquid metal batteries are coming online. We have uh, a, a, a pilot deployment out in Hawaii of one megawatt size of uh, flow batteries that's going in uh, at uh, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. And uh, the use of batteries is not only for just storage to extend, if you will, the solar day or the wind day, it, it certainly can do that at grid level, but it's also, it can be a buffer for the kinds of uh, quality of electricity that you need for various functions. So when you start up a diesel generator set, the, uh, the power can be, in terms of frequency and voltage, can be very, very choppy. And you want to be able to buffer that, and a, a battery is a good way to do that. So as the prices come down, uh, as the uh, needs for where's the best value coming out of a deployment of storage are going to be coming of apparent from our analysis. We're going to be deploying more and more storage. And I think that the, uh, the price curve will come down as it has for wind and solar, perhaps not as dramatically, but, but down nevertheless. And we're seeing some really, really nice uh, applications of uh, battery storage and distributed generation across the world. Last year, there was $10 billion um, invested in storage and $312 billion invested in renewable energy around the world. <laughs> And so they are going to get to these price declines that solar and wind have seen. Um, and certainly, the link to batteries life is happening. Um, and to the point about uh, um, these kind of what we're seeing in terms of development, most of renewable energy investment is now moving from the West to the developed markets of the West. 
to emerging markets. And for them, renewable distributed power is already the cheapest, best option. And so I think what we're going to see over the next 10 years is really going to be remarkable in terms of up. So and so that will have a huge impact on price and price declines. Last week I was out in California at a forum, and uh, we had uh, the honor of uh, being addressed by uh, the Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon. And uh, he was talking about uh, his view of where things were going as a result of uh, COP21 in Paris. And he addressed this uh, point about people not only wanting to have cleaner and more reliable power, but people wanting and needing to have power in uh, some of the developing world. And as Dan pointed out, uh, the opportunities for deploying distributed generation, storage, solar, wind, geothermal, hydro in places like uh, Africa and India is really immense. It's a great value proposition. We don't have to replicate what we have done in the United States and in, in the Western world with very large centrally uh, uh, operated power plants with large complex transmission and distribution systems. We can put the, uh, the power where the people is and, uh, and keep it very, very reliable and also uh, in a, in a uh, very, very low uh, footprint in terms of environmental impacts. And the interesting thing about that is one of the enabling features is actually a cell phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that really allows a, a developer to put these small scale solar and other things out and have right. someone pay for them in very small increments. And so a lot of times, you know, the innovation you really need when it comes to some of these technologies is in finance, and you were seeing this with PPAs or other things. You know, you need more innovation other than just the innovation technologies to right. make them go. And I can't, um, you know, we, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about something big that happened in Paris in December, which was the president and 19 other countries made pledges in terms of doubling the amount of um, uh, resources they were going to put into energy R&D. And the amount that we put into energy R&D in this country is woefully low, considering the size of this energy sector. And so I think this is going to be huge. So if you have 80% of um, the, or the countries that represent 80% of the world's emissions getting in and increasing um, their energy R&D with really early technology, I think that's going to be a game changer. And certainly DOD is joined with DOE um, and USDA on things like right. advanced biofuels and other things. So working across um, you know, the government to support some of these initiatives is important. The private sector really, uh, we, we do a lot of work with utilities that supply our, our bases with, uh, with electricity. And the utility model is changing very rapidly as well as they adopt uh, some of these technologies and business models. And uh, it's really a, it's a good partnership. So if we can give everybody a round of applause, unfortunately, we're out of time for, for questions. But I'm sure since there's so many. Wow, this is like a press conference here. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to take two super, we'll take three, because I'm in a nice mood today. Really quickly, it's a question, so not a statement. <laughs> Right. Thank you so much. Question. Uh, I want to congratulate the, the Navy on all of this tremendous work in, in renewable energy. And there's one area that people may not be aware of that the Navy spent a lot of energy on, uh, Dr. Spack at Spawer. And the work that he did <clears throat> in what's called lighting the new fire, okay? This whole idea that, you know, Martin Fleischman and Stephen Pons worked on and they were quote unquote debunked by Caltech and MIT. It turns out that Caltech and MIT didn't get it right. And, Professor Peter Higelstein at MIT has kind of pointed out how that worked. My question is, why haven't the budgets gone up in this area? Because they really should. I mean, you talked about mission effectiveness. You talked about duration. You talked about putting things, you know, over the enemy and having it be able to stay there for a right. long time, okay, and not have any, you know, footprint, not be detectable. It seems like this technology, quite apart from the energy side, has tremendous military applications as well. Right. And perhaps you, you have put the budgets in it and you just can't tell us about it. But That's gonna... true, uh, <laughs> to, to an extent. Uh, but um, no, we are doing a, a tremendous amount uh, with uh, systems that uh, are unmanned, if you will, uh, drones, robots, uh, on the sea, uh, under the sea and above the sea in the air. Uh, and a lot of that is uh, hinged upon creating greater energy density that allows them to have more range and staying power and payload. We're doing that. Uh, last, uh, late last year, uh, Secretary Mabus uh, and the uh, Chief of Naval Operations uh, designated a program executive officer 
and a, uh, assistant sec a D deputy assistant secretary for research development and uh, acquisition focused on unmanned systems, just to underline your point. Quick question, yeah. Uh, taking things back to early part of the discussion on biofuels, and if I understood your comment correctly, uh, the Navy acquires 78 percent of its fuel somewhere other than the United States or its energy somewhere other than the United States. Is there a logistical issue on having biofuel of the right specifications located elsewhere in the world in order to support the Navy's operations? Right. There is right now, but we're hoping to change that through uh, working with uh, folks like uh, Airlines for America, the civil aviation industry, not just in the United States, but uh, internationally, is keenly interested in reducing their greenhouse gases. And a, a way to do that is to have aviation uh, fuel that is uh, at least partially uh, constant constituted to ASTM standards by biofuels. So this will, it, we're starting down this uh, path to uh, greater availability, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world of biofuels. And that's why the, uh, the work with uh, nations like Italy, Australia, Chile, and others really means uh, so much. And we'll and collect the last two questions from this side if you want to. I was just going to say, it's really critical because the Navy concern, consumes half or one third of all operational energy, but the Air Force consumes half. So the Navy's really leading the way, and the Air Force is interested in having them <laughs> succeed, right? We, <laughs> we, we, we work with them very closely. Yeah. We'll collect the two questions yep. at the same time. Um, Alan on Global America Business Institute. Uh, we do programs on nuclear and other low carbon energy sources, issues related to those sources. Uh, my question was on, uh, so, so one of the trends in the nuclear industry is to look at smaller, more compact reactors, uh, small modular reactors. So I was wondering to what extent is this on the Department of Defense's radar? Um, you have a lot of you have many developers here in the U.S. Uh, obviously, there are smaller units, so you lose some of the economies of scale from the, your conventional gigawatt plant. But uh, you know, basically, what these developers need is is, is an offer sheet, a large offer sheet, so they can uh, develop the you know economies of of, of learning, uh, repetition, right. mass production. Uh, I can't think of a better entity than the DOD to sort of take the lead on this. Um, if you're looking for a, a low carbon source, reliable, right. resilient source, I can't think of a, a, a better source right. than energy source than nuclear. Obviously, the Navy has its expertise with its reactor, sure. you know, fleets on uh, uh, reactor fleet. Let me just, let me gonna... just say that the, our small modular yep. reactors are called submarines and, yeah. uh, <laughs> and, and aircraft carriers. Uh, we are uh, obviously staying in touch with uh, the, uh, the the nuclear industry. Uh, we do not have a a current program in the Department of Defense to uh, do uh, any significant amount of research on small modular reactors where this is a commercial development. I've spoken uh, quite a while back with uh, Secretary Moniz and uh, we agree that, uh, well, if you could wave a magic wand uh, covered with gold and dollars uh, over the, the SMR industry, it'd be great. I mean, the concept is great. It's a matter of the uh, non-recurring engineering and the, and the cost of those first dozen or so prototypes that uh, is something that uh, would require a, a all of government national initiative to to get there and uh, right now I don't see the uh, the will to do that and very last question right here Terry Hill with the eMERGE Alliance what role will direct current play in the future of the military's energy portfolio we're not anticipating uh, a large scale uh, transfer over to direct current, but where it makes sense, especially our data centers and, uh, and our IT infrastructure, where you can avoid the inefficiencies that are inherent in converting from uh, direct current to, uh, to uh, uh, alternating current, it makes sense to do so. But there isn't a, right now a large scale effort to uh, convert uh, our motors on ships, for example, to, to direct current. Awesome. Thank you so much for such detailed answers and for being here today. So a round of applause for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.